Good evening, ladies. Happy Wednesday. Are you excited to be here? Uh, just want to draw your attention to the screen. If you are new, there are ways that you can connect with us, and you can see the teaching if you want to go back or if you have to miss a Wednesday night. Um, our YouTube channel is FBC Conyers or online, firstconyers.com slash women. So just wanted you to know you can connect with us through Facebook and Instagram as well. So we all want to stay connected. We're just really uh, looking forward. We are digging into the entire chapter two tonight. Um, and we're praying and expecting to hear from God. And I, I just kept hearing what Karen said last week. We need, we need to posture ourselves before the Lord as learners. So we come to his word, not just to check it off. And we don't come to Bible study to say, yeah, I've been there, done that. We come so that we can learn and that we can learn him. He desires to reveal himself. And he's in every page of the word of God, even when his name is not there. Because why? We learned last week, God is always at work. Always at work. Always at work. <laughs> we have a mantra at our table. God is always at work. Oh, my. So, anyway, let's pray and we will begin this evening. Heavenly Father, we bow before you. I'm just so grateful that you have not left us to ourselves, that you have given us your living word so that we might come to know the living word, Jesus Christ, more and more. So, tonight we want to posture ourselves as learners before you, that you would prepare our hearts, our ears, our minds to hear and understand and receive, God, all that you have for us. We pray a blessing and we pray for our teacher that you would just speak through her and that every word that is of you would come forth and you would just eliminate anything that's not of you, eliminate distractions from us tonight, God. And again, Lord, we just thank you, and we ask that you be exalted and magnified tonight in this place, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, what if there was a moment in your life um, that could change the course and direction of your future forever? And what if that would solidify the spiritual purpose that God had for your life? And that it would, what this change in your life would impact people around you and reverberate through their lives, uh, spiritually speaking. Would you take it? Yeah. Mo most of us say yes, right? But what if that opportunity also meant giving up a deeply held dream? Or if it came with a lot of pain and a lot of suffering? Or you had to give up something precious in the process? Would you still say yes so quickly? Maybe we think about it a little bit more, right? I mean, so when we think about Esther, we're up to chapter two here, and mostly we think about her as being the queen, right? Glamorous and beautiful and, you know, this life of luxury. Now, who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want that kind of life? But the image that we have of her and of her story usually is... Uh, not exactly the way it lines up when you start studying the actual scripture because her life turned out to be quite different than she no doubt imagined that it would be. Um, but her dedication to God, her willingness to risk everything in a crucial moment in the life of Israel stands as a constant reminder for us here so many thousands of years later to be faithful to Jesus, to give ourselves fully to him, and to his purposes, even when things don't turn out quite the way we might expect. Um, so recap from last week, we began this study, or from two weeks ago, we, we began, and we were introduced to Xerxes in, at the beginning of chapter 1 and the end of chapter 1, uh, who was this powerful king of Persia, and we got a peek into this huge fanfare right at the uh, first uh, couple of verses, uh, that he put on in order to bring a lot of people on his side uh, to, uh, uh, to see the power and the, the might of his empire. And that first chapter really is painted so we can get an understanding of the volatility of Xerxes and the tenuous atmosphere that existed all in the palace. And so Xerxes held tremendous power wielded it how, when, where he wanted 
22 and with no thought to how it impacted others. And uh, we even learned at the end of uh, last chapter that the beautiful queen Vashti, his best and favorite girl, wasn't safe from his unpredictability. Um, and so she ended up being banished from his presence. So as we move on to chapter two, we're about to meet Esther and we have a different view of what her life might be like uh, just studying what we learned in chapter one. It's not all the glamor as we kind of uh, sometimes are taught. Uh, yes, there was luxury. Yes, there was opulence, but those things uh, were not a source of comfort or safety for her because she lived and existed after she went to the palace in an extremely dangerous world, and she had to be really careful not to become the object of Xerxes' disapproval or wind up in the crosshairs of his manipula manipulative advisor. So let's get going in chapter two. We got a lot of cover tonight. So we start with verse one. Later, when the anger of King Xerxes had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. Now, the tendency is to read this verse as a, a direct chronological continuation of chapter 1. But basically, there's no space that this just happened just you know, a few days later or a few weeks later. But that's not really true um, because the fury uh, of King Xerxes here is not really the same fury that we saw after the party where he banished, uh, uh, where uh, uh, Vashti wouldn't come to see him. And so her, so we have to look at, okay, if we look at a couple of verses, we'll see that there's some time that passes between these. And so you see in chapter 1, verse 3, it says that this big party was in the third year of his reign. And in verse 16 of this chapter, we see that she, that is Esther, was taken into King Xerxes in the seventh year of his reign. So if you factor in a year of beauty treatments that she gets, we see that between chapter one and chapter two, three to four years uh, elapses. And so it's hard to imagine that a self-absorbed king would still be fuming over the same event with Vashti so many years later. Um, so remember he was drunk, so how much he remembers and how it all went, we don't know if he ever remembers all that either. So, but we go back to verse one, First word is later. Now, in English language, uh, that can be five minutes from now or ten years ago from now. That's later, right? But the, the better translation of this word here is after these things. After these things. So you have to say, so what things, what historical things happened in those three words right there? And in fact, we learned that some really important events um, happened are in encompassed in that phrase right there. So let me hold and school you again for a minute. If you like history, you'll like this part. If not, just hold on, we'll be done in a minute. <laughs> we already know that Xerxes became obsessed with Greece. We looked at those maps before. Huge kingdom he had, but he was completely focused on Greece and taking them over. That's because his father, Darius the Great, previously tried to take over Greece, but he was convincingly defeated by the, them. And uh, that happened at the Battle of Marathon, if you remember that. That's actually where we get our word marathon, because where, when, uh, when the, the Greeks defeated the Persians there, they dispatched a runner to run all the way back to Athens to tell them the news of this great victory. And you might guess it was 26.2 miles from the battlefield at Marathon to Athens, and that's where we get our marathon. In fact, when the Greeks first held their the first Olympics, they had a marathon that was 26.2 miles because they were celebrating this victory. It was a huge, big thing. So uh, that's just a little aside, but after Xerxes took over from Darius the Great, he wanted to finish what his dad had started. He's like, yeah, they can't treat us like that. We'll show you. And so he took those first years as his rulers to amass this enormous army and navy so he could squash the Greeks, make a mockery of them, and uh, vindicate his dad and all of Persia. And so that six-month fanfare at the beginning of uh, chapter one is just Xerxes flexing. He's saying, hey, look at us, we're awesome. And so between chapters one and chapter two, the Persian Empire under Xerxes invaded Greece and a ground, after a ground war that lasted almost a year time, year's time, there was huge losses on both sides. And, and if you've ever seen the movie or heard of the movie, The 300 from a few years ago, mm -hmm. that is a fictionalized story of the battle 
between them to the Battle of Thermopylae, and it takes place between the Spartans and the Persians during this time. So if we bypass all the places and names and dates that nobody really cares about in this long history lesson, we jump to the end. Records tell us that the tide of the conflict ultimately turned in, in favor of the Greeks at the Battle of Salamis. And yeah, I'll just put this up here because what happened, it was a naval battle and these little narrow passageways here and there, the, uh, the Greek ships were smaller and more mobile. And so they were able to take advantage of the immobility of the big, huge Persian ships and they were defeated here while Xerxes stood on the shore and watched the ships go down in flames. And so he's really mad <laughs> um, and he said, I'm leaving the, this to the generals and I'm going back to Susa. And so he said, y'all win the battle. And so after a little while longer, they were defeated. They didn't, weren't, weren't able to prevail. And uh, so that was the end of the Persian War there. So all that happened between the space of chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Esther. So when he returned home, he was really mad, like I said, and began and about being defeated and how poorly this big plan that he had was supposed to be this crowning achievement of his ruin uh, of his reign, and uh, but it all turned to ruin and all turned to ashes. And so now, after more time has elapsed, we're back to chapter, chapter two, verse one. He says, "When his anger over the defeat uh, by the Greeks subsided, he remembered Vashti. Now he's starting to think about his girl, right? So." <laughs> He doesn't remember a lot about the drunken rage, maybe. All he remembers at this point is how much he missed her. Now remember Vashti? The word Vashti means desired or best, so this is the one he liked the best. Now, uh, his advisors know that the, what the king is like and how volatile he is, and if he is missing his favorite girl and, and knows she is gone because of a rule that they suggested, they know how quickly that anger can be turn from, from what happened to them. So they start scrambling here to try to save their own skin. They're like, okay, we gotta get the mad king, not mad, really fast, or it's gonna be bad for us. So this is their solution, verse two. He says, the personal attendants were supposed, let a search be made for beautiful young virgins for the king. And he goes on and talks in verse three here about he sent these commissioners out through his 127 provinces to go gather these girls into the harem and, uh, and then put in charge under the king's eunuch who's going to take care of them and give them beauty treatments and make them look really pretty. And so obviously, uh, then they say, let the girl who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. And obviously the advice appealed to the king and he followed it. So this is for the setup for how we're going to meet Esther. And I'll explain more about this part, this how she ends up at the... Um, at the, at the palace of Susa in a minute, but let's keep going because we're going to meet another main character in verse 5, and this is, now there was in the citadel of Susa, a Jew named Mordecai. He's the fourth person that we meet that's really important to the story here. Verse 6 tells us really quickly how he got there, that he was brought to uh, uh, Persia when Nebuchadnezzar overran Jerusalem and brought the, uh, the slaves back. And so he was probably really young, maybe even a baby at the time, but that's how he's getting there. He's a slave. Now, we don't know uh, 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 a lot about Mordecai, but there's one thing we do know, a couple of things that we do know, and it's easy to go right past this, and um, that he is from the tribe of Benjamin, the son of Kish. Now you're like, okay, who is Kish? Big deal. I don't know who that guy is. Well, underline that on your pe paper or in your Bible, if you've got a pe your Bible out there. And I want you to put a cross-reference next to that of 1 Samuel 9, verses 1 and 2. We're going to come back to this in two weeks. Next week is um, the first and foremost. But in two weeks when we get back together, we'll, but this is important. There was a Benjamite, a man of standing. His name was Kish. There's our guy. He had a son named Saul, an impressive young man without equal among the Israelites. A head taller than any of the, of the others. And so uh, so he, Morde the one thing we need to know, and we'll come back to this like I said, that Mordecai's ancestors trace back to the family of King Saul, the first king of Israel. Now, other thing we know about, about Mordecai is that he is a relative of a, 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 a young Jewish girl named Hadassah. Now, Hadassah is uh, Esther's Jewish name, 
And uh, when her mom and dad died, basically, he took over, took her in and um, raised her, came like her father. And that's what it says in verse 7 there. And so that, this is a sad start to this girl's life. He lost both her mom and her dad, but she's got Mordecai, and he takes good care of her. Now, as the story moves along, we'll see Mordecai advising her as she goes along, telling her what to do and helping her navigate the situation at the palace. Um, verse 11 tells us that every day he walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. Because we already know what Xerxes is like, right? We know he's fickle, he's prone to anger, he is highly ma manipulatable. So this is a dangerous situation for a girl who doesn't know anything about court life, hasn't been around it. And so Mordecai is looking in on her frequently, making sure she is okay. But we got a little ahead of our story as it unfolds. The middle section of chapter 2 tells us about what happens to Esther and all these girls and how they end up at the, the palace. Now, here's where I want you to basically erase pretty much everything you've been taught, especially if you've been taught about Esther as a child. You know, if you came, were raised in church and when you came up and you learned about the beautiful Queen Esther and what a wonderful grand story this is and how, how amazing it was. Now, it is an amazing story of God working in the background to bring about his will, but this is not a G-rated movie. This is not a G-rated movie uh, where she meets the king and lives happily forever after. That is not what happens here. Let me tell you that this, this idea and this plan from these advisors is an evil, horrible, terrible plan that they concoct to satiate the king's most base and fleshly desires. And again, don't let the fact that she got a year of beauty treatments make you think that this was glamorous. It was not glamorous, okay? First of all, besides making these girls look their best for this king and erasing the effects of doing hard agricultural labor, which a lot of them probably did, a big part of this year of separation before going in to see the king is that they were making sure these girls were not pregnant. Okay? They wanted to make sure there's no babies in the harem that weren't Xerxes, so there's no paternity test back then, so this is how they did it. They separated from the king for a year, make sure every no no babies show up, and then they were able to come and see the king. So now, this is how they get there. Verse 8. Now the NIV does not do a good translation of this, so this is a different translation. Uh, so when the king, look at these words that I got highlighted here. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young girls were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in custody of Haggai, Esther was also taken into the king's palace and put into custody of Haggai, who had charge of these women. Now, does order taken in custody sound like something that they wanted to do? Mm. And this was voluntary? Absolutely not. Now remember 127 provinces? It's a big kingdom. So I looked at some of the, uh, the resources on this, and some suggested that uh, as much to 400 or more girls were gathered together and brought to the, to the king here. And uh, they are taken from their homes forcefully, no voluntary here, and they are never returned. They never go back to their homes after this. Uh, this is not an episode of The Bachelor or Miss America where you sign up and you go, and if you don't win, you go back home and resume your life. That's not what's going on here. Let me give you a modern term for what's actually happened here, and that is sex trafficking. <laughs> she, it, they are taken involuntary, used for the pleasure of the king, but now remember, beauty treatments and palace does not make this any prettier. Um, this is not a Disney princess story. It is evil and horrific. So verse 12, this is what it tells here. Before girls turn came to go into the king, she completed these 12 months of beauty treatments, and then this is how she would go into the king. Anything she wanted was given her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. No. So the idea here is, is when, when it was the girl's turn to go in to be with, with Xerxes, they could take clothes or jewelry or whatever they wanted to here, and when they left the king Xerxes, they could take it and keep it. So basically, that is payment for services rendered. If you didn't win, that's what you got. <laughs> you know, so uh, verse 14 goes on to say, in the evening she would go there, and in the morning return to another part of the harem uh, in the care of Shazgar, Shazgar, I got to practice that, 
<laughs> the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines, she would not return to the king unless he was pleased with her and summoned her by name. So, one night stand right there. That's what that is. And these girls were consigned then to the non-virgin part of the harem after they'd been with Xerxes one time. Their usefulness is over, and, uh, and these girls were not allowed to return home, like I said, but stayed there in the other part of the harem for the rest of their life, most likely never being called uh, to see the king again. I remember 400, 500 women, he can't remember what name they are, unless they really impressed him, that's it. That was your one shot, you're done. So they have no home, no family, no future, no dreams, basically warehoused with several other hundred girls for the rest of their lives for the duration of the king's reign. And if a new king, king came in, guess what? What did he get? The harem. So then he, they were passed to another king. The, their determination of their lives was over. So all their hopes for their plan, fa family plans, they are destroyed by the king's advisors who want to distract Xerxes from being mad at them. A mad king's not good for them, so they don't care who they hurt in the process. Mm -hmm. So they appeal to his flesh, care nothing for hundreds of women um, and, and what happens to them. So this is such a sad story as far as these girls go. So, um, but that's, uh, that's what happened. And so jumping a little forward, we find out, this is a spoiler alert, we find out in verse 17 that the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women. And she won his favor and approval more than any other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So Esther wins, and we all go, yay, the heroine, she wins. But remember what the prize is, right? Okay? <laughs> she gets to be married to a drunken, volatile, angry, pagan, womanizing king who's not concerned about anything but his own pleasure. Hooray, right? <laughs> Wonderful. But so that seems like where the, the chapter would end, but we've got more coming. So there's another party. Lots of parties going to happen during the whole book of, the, of Esther. Uh, so he decides he wants to celebrate. Uh, so he gives a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all his nobles and officials. And he proclaims a holiday and gives gifts. So, And then verse 19 says, when the virgins were assembled the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. So this is another thing we learned about Mordecai from this little phrase. It's easy to go right over it. And, you know, think King's Gate, you're thinking, okay, is it a thing opening? Why is he sitting by the gate? But really, the King's Gate is not an actual gate. This is Xerxes' palace at the time of Esther. This is the King's Gate. It's actually a building. So, and what, what happened there was that it was um, legal, civil, and commercial business was transacted here. So since he was sitting at the King's Gate, it meant that Mordecai had some kind of position in Xerxes' uh, uh, palace and around so he he had some level of authority there and so uh this so that's what he did he's sitting at the king's day during this party uh, i kind of skipped over this before but verse 20 said that mordecai advised esther to keep her uh, uh her jewish heritage as a secret for the time being now uh the bible is silent on whether that was a good idea or not y'all can talk about that. that's one of the questions for tonight in in your discussion if you want to talk about that but uh, presumably, the reason that he told her that is because there is a, an air of anti-Semitism that exists in Persia. And we're going to see that inflamed really fast in the next chapter. So, uh, so uh, that, but moving on, it says that while he was at the king's gate during this party, he overhears these two guys who are planning an assassination attempt of Xerxes. Now, assassination attempts were common back then. They were very real, happened with some frequently. And if you jump to the end of Xerxes' life, find that that's how his life ends, is that it's a, success, a successful assassination attempt. So, um, so he found out about this plan, reported it to Esther, who then reports it to the king and gives credit to Mordecai for it. Now, usually acts of loyalty like this were rewarded immediately uh, because... Of course, the king wants to encourage people to look out for his best interests, so he will reward them with uh, jewels or authority or something like that And if they, if they report these assassination attempts. But in this case, the report, uh, the report was investigated, found to be true. They were hanged, 
It was recorded in the book of the annals in the presence of the king, but he's not rewarded at all. Now, that'll become really pivotal to the whole story in a little while. But um, so that's where chapter two ends. It's kind of a cliffhanger, right? So um, we have to then go. So what do we learn from this? What do we learn about God from this? So our application for chapter two, it, 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 there's always something that we can apply to our, from all parts of scripture that we can apply to our lives. So we just have to dig for it. But our application for this is that Esther was not some random girl who just happened to win the favor of the king. She's just not one of 400 out there, and good luck, you know, we're glad that you won. There's not just not some pagan girl from Assyria or Moab who's prettier than her, and it's just luck, right? It's not. Esther was created by God with immense beauty for her role at this time in the life of Israel. Verse 17 told us that uh, in this chapter tells us that Xerxes was attracted to her more than any other woman. God did that specifically on purpose with a role for her in mind. That's what Psalm 139 tells us, right? Knitted together in her mother's womb, fearfully, wonderfully made by God. Mordecai, remember, he was a slave initially, right? So how likely is it that he ends up as a civil leader in Persia <laughs> and just happens to be in the right place to overhear this assassination plot at the moment where Esther is also in a position to have the favor of the king? Is that just coincidence? No, no. Did God, so now, did God make Xerxes officials come up with this evil plan? No, but did he use it? He absolutely did. God can redeem anything. He's the only one, in fact, who can take evil and bring good out of it. Now, keep reminding you, this is not a children's story. This is a plan that stole Esther's purity and all of her dreams about how her life might play out. Put her in the place of servitude to this volatile, pagan, drunken, pleasure-seeking king for her whole life. This is a tough place to be. But yet, in all the sin, and all the evil, all the wickedness, God overruled. And the same is true for you. Now, how many people were here at church on Sunday? How many people were here today? Yeah, a lot of you, okay? I love when God does this. Yes. I mean, I, I wrote this lesson for this Esther chapter 2 last summer, okay? And it just happened to fall on the same week as when Jamo's out of town. He's away. We have a guest speaker here who uses the very same passage of scripture that I'm going to use to end this lesson. Love this. <laughs> this is what I call my verily, verily principle, right? Remember from the King James Version, read the, uh, read the Gospels. Jesus would say, look at his disciples and go, verily, verily, I say to you, which just means truly, truly, I say to you. And whatever he said after that was always something really powerful and important. It was like he was saying, listen up, this is important. So when I hear the same, kept over my uh, uh, spiritual walk with the Lord, when I have to hear two things, that are basically the same thing in a very close amount of time, I know that it's God saying to me, listen up, this is important. And so I think that that's what he's doing here because I really got excited on Sunday because I'm like, ah, oh, this is so great. So <laughs> it's like God is saying something to, important to me and he's saying something important to you. So the guy from Sunday, he used these verses to focus on God moving people from places far away to the United States here. And I'm going to use the same verses to apply this to you. So I want you to say Acts chapter 17, really important. If you did not underline this in your Bible and didn't make a note of it on Sunday, please do. These are such important verses. You can just get your brain around what this is saying here. It's, it's pivotal, life-changing. So uh, this is Paul speaking. He says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. That's sovereignty. That's God's sovereignty right there. He rules over all. Nothing's outside of his influence and control. Verse 25. And he is not served by human hands as if he needs anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. There's more sovereignty there. Everything comes from him. Life and breath. And then Paul just says, okay, and everything else too. It all comes from him. And here's the verse. Here's this really important verse here. From one man... He made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the set times for them in the exact places they should live. Look at that. He determined the times set for them in the exact places they should live. Do you see what that says? There is no accident that you were here. 
the plans or determinations of other people have, that have exerted on you through your life have no bearing on where you are. Mm -hmm. They do not trump God's sovereignty in your life. Mm -hmm. They don't. And so he formed you exactly the way you are with all the gifts and talents and quirks and idiosyncrasies and likes and dislikes with a plan in mind. And just like Mordecai, you are exactly positioned where you need to be for the reason that he created you. That means he put you in Conyers, Georgia for a reason. You are at your job, your apartment, your house, your marriage, your difficult place with so many fear, confusing questions still swirling around your head from your past, this past that you still struggle with. Your backstory can be just as messy and confusing and full of pain and motivated by the evil intentions of others as what happened to Esther. It can also feel like you are compelled to be in a place you never planned to be, just like Mordecai. And, but the truth is that you are there for a reason. Here he is, verse 27. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. There is your reason for being. It's why you are where you are. You can still have so many questions uh, 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 that you are working through, feelings of abandonment or self-loathing or loneliness or fear or just plain old monotony. And you're wondering, what is this all about? But all of this is so much bigger than you. Verse 27 is clear. We do not need to get out our Greek concordance and look it up words to figure out what that means. That is pretty plain. Not a lot of interpretation. You are where you are. You are made the way you are for the purpose of helping others find Jesus. Mm -hmm. That is it. Now, you're probably not going to save a whole nation like Esther did, but you might be part of saving a life from eternal destruction. Yes, unsaved family members, children, grandchildren, neighbors, husbands, parents, or you know people who are straying away from the Lord. You have been positioned where you are to help them find him. But if you're so focused on your own happiness and I've got to have this and they've been mistreating me and they can't do that or this thing from 2, 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago that you cannot let go of, you are missing your calling. You're missing your calling. Have you considered that the person that is right in front of you that causes you the most frustration might be the one that you're put there to influence? How are you doing with that? But is life so turned in on yourself and your situation to the point that you have lost your eternal perspective? I know things that are difficult from your past. Everybody has things that they struggle with. But you will never get past them to embrace what God has for you until you stop giving the enemy more power in your life than God. Okay? There are many stories of horrific, evil things that have happened to people. And that, but those same, some of those same people have chosen to put their pain into the hands of God and let him redeem it. Okay? And like a preacher I like to listen to says, he says, he turns it and takes your past and weaponizes it against the devil. Ooh. That is... What he intended to use for evil, you can use to bring glory to God. Because even when it's you who made bad choices and you're the one who chose the wrong path and you brought hurt in other people's lives, uh, you know what? That's not beyond God's grace to redeem either. Amen. Okay? Instead of being terrible reminders of failure when we look back on our past mistakes, you can use those events to remind you of God's great love and forgiveness. It's not too big. You want to take the punch out of the, of the enemy's accusation? Every time you remember your own failure, every time he hurls something at you, every time, start praising God for his mercy, his love, and the blood of Jesus that covers all sin. Let me tell you, the enemy will stop bringing that up to you if you use it as a way to praise God. Okay? Now, you have to let go of the guilt and condemnation and be consistent with it, but that will work. I guarantee you, let praise 
flow from your mouth because no matter what the devil or anybody else throws at you, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All of this begins with a commitment to the truth. Dwell in it, rehearse it, apply it, stop looking down at your situation and start looking up at Jesus. You are still here. You are still seeking God. The fact that you are sitting in this room tonight tells me that that is true. You can be a thousand different places doing a thousand different other things, but you are here sitting and listening to the word of God. That means there is something that he has for you to accomplish. You might not know what that is until eternity, but you can commit to him and trust what he said is true. Esther chapter 2 is your story designed and placed. You have been designed specifically and placed specifically. Uh, and if you can orient yourself around this idea, he did it and he determined the set times for you and the exact places where you should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Just think about that. Amen? Amen. God, we just thank you that we can trust you that our stories are so small when we look at them that you have so much more going on than we can ever see. So God, when we get turned in on ourselves, God, open our eyes up to what you put us here for. And that is that you have revealed your son to us, that you have saved us, you have cleansed us of our sin. And God, you have given us your message to take to the world. God, give us boldness. Reset our thinking. So we're not focused on ourselves, but we are focused on you. And we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.